Um, so my name is Kimberly Shao. I am a second year resident at the University of Connecticut. I uh, grew up in New York and then uh, did my medical school at the University of Pennsylvania in Philly. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you guys today. Thanks for inviting me uh, to talk about some bread and butter germ cases. So these will be cases that like pretty commonly come through our clinic, as well as cases that by the end of even our first year of residency, we should be able to recognize. Um, so the first thing that I'll do is um, just a couple disclaimers. So the first and foremost is that none of this should be used as medical advice. If there's one thing I've learned in dermatology, it's that even if you read a textbook cover to cover, um, you'll, you're still bound to get a rash or a skin cancer that looks nothing like what's in the textbook. And then treatments are sort of like an art. Um, again, you can read a, a textbook cover to cover, but uh, treatments are going to be based on the individual patient, based on providers. So this is just a general talk. Um, the other thing is I have no disclosures. And then the last is that um, most of these photos are from Visual DX. So I want to give them a shout out. Um, and I tried to include as much as possible because I think it's really important, uh, a bunch of different skin types for like each of the disorders that I show. So the way that I kind of organize this talk is that I'm just gonna go like, through a bunch of like Derm 101 cases that like might walk through my clinic. Um, I'm focusing mostly on how to recognize uh, the either skin condition, not so much on treatment, but I will touch on a couple of things um, that I think are either cool or important. Um, so I think because I have a lot of cases, the way that we should do this is that I'm just gonna give my lecture and then leave the end for any questions that people have, if that sounds good. Cool. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, so the first patient we have here, a 16 year old female comes in complaining about bumps on her, along her jawline. She says they started about a month ago or a few months ago. Um, and she says she plays field hockey. So when we, when you start dermatology, if you ever get to a dermatology rotation, the first thing they're going to tell you is like the importance of learning how to describe the lesion, because this is the language that we use to communicate. And there are even like buzz, certain buzzwords that if you know how to describe that, someone will know exactly the disorder that you're talking about before you even say the name that, of the diagnosis that you're thinking of. So when we think about describing the lesion, the first is where's the location? So where is it on the body? The next is what's the color of the lesion? Is it pink? Is it brown? Is it hyperpigmented, hypopigmented, white, green, yellow? Yellow. Um, and then morphology is probably like one of the most important. So when we talk about morphology, there's a couple different uh, descriptors that we use. So I'll go through these and in the right hand corner will be a couple pictures as I talk about them. So a macule is going to be a flat lesion. So if you close your eyes and like ran your finger along a spot, it's like totally flat. You wouldn't even know it's there. And a macule is when it's less than a centimeter. If it's flat and over a centimeter, that's going to be a patch. This is compared to a papule. So a papule is going to be a raised lesion. So again, if you ran your finger over it with your eyes closed, you definitely feel that something is there. Um, when it's a papule, it's less than a centimeter. When it's a plaque, it's greater than a centimeter. A wheel is what most people call hive. So if you get a bug bite, that's usually like a forms a wheel and it's descriptive for like a swollen or an edematous papule. So papule again, like if you ran your finger over it, you can feel it. Um, a vesicle on the other hand is um, a, almost a like papule, but it's this like fluid filled space. Um, so it's like when you get a blister, that's gonna be a vesicle. A vesicle is again, when it's less than a centimeter, it's a vesicle. When it's greater than a centimeter, it's a bulla. A nodule uh, or a tumor is gonna be a uh, raised lesion, but it's deeper in the skin. Um, so it's really big and it's deep. A cyst is similar to a nodule or a tumor, but if you felt it, it's gonna feel kind of squishy because there's fluid in it. So when there's fluid or debris in it, we call it a cyst. Um, and then lastly, 
a, a pustule, a furuncle or an abscess is gonna be sort of like a cyst, uh, but it's gonna be filled specifically with pus. Um, when it's a pustule, it's like kind of small, like in this picture, um, when it's a furuncle, that usually means it's associated with a hair follicle and usually larger. And an abscess too is going to be a really deep, large cyst kind of filled with pus. Um, there's also secondary features that you can just use to describe a lesion. So these are going to be things like, is it smooth? Is it scaly? Is it scratched? So that means excoriated. Is it atrophic? That means it's kind of scar-like. Does it have crust on it? Um, if it's a blister, is it a tense blister? Like if you press on it, it stays a blister? Or is it a flaccid blister? Like if you press on it, it breaks open immediately. Um, and then the last thing that's important when you're describing a lesion is the pattern of distribution. So it might just be one single spot, um, or it could be a bunch of different spots, and it might be important to know how the spots are arranged. So is it just all over the body? Is it only on one arm? Is it in a geometrical shape, like a, it, all of a sudden these like papules, just like in a square shape? Um, is it linear? Is it on both sides of the body? Is it on one side of the body? Um, so these are things that we talk about when we're describing rashes or describing lesions. This is like the crux of derm. So. Let's go back to our first patient. Our first patient, uh, the location of her lesions, they are on the lateral cheeks and the jawline. Uh, the color of them, they're kind of red, light pink, uh, the morphology. So remember we said that papules are gonna be raised lesions. So there's a mix of these like pink papules as well as some pustules. So you can probably see that there are some that kind of have pus in them. And then the distribution, you can't see the other side of her cheek, but she tells us that they're on both sides of her cheeks. So they're on her face and it's symmetrical. So this is a pretty easy one. This is classic um, acne. We call it acne vulgaris. And when we talk about acne, there's basically three classifications of acne. There's comodomal acne, uh, which means that it's uh, there are open and closed comedones. Open comedones are what uh, we colloquially call blackheads, and closed comedones are more like uh, so that's a closed comedone, and then an open comedone is more like blackhead. Kind of hard to see this picture, uh, but a closed comedone is like a whitehead. And then uh, inflammatory acne is more kind of what this patient has. Uh, so you see lots of redness. So lots of red bumps. That's like inflammatory. And the nodule cystic, uh, which this uh, photo doesn't really show, is going to be that deep uh, kind of acne, uh, these big, deep red cysts that sometimes don't even come to a head. You don't even get that pustule white head on top of it. Um, other features that you look for uh, when you talk about acne, you want to look for scarring and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So that's like dark marks after acne, because a lot of times patients not only want to treat the acne, but they want to treat the scarring um, and, the, uh, and the dark marks that they get afterwards. In addition to that, sometimes uh, the way that you treat acne might be changed if there's evidence of scarring already. Um, and then there's also like these other variations of acne. So there's acne excoriae. Um, so that is the term that we use when somebody's like really picking and scratching at their acne. It's leaving like these picked ulcers um, or erosions. And then acne mechanica is another specific type of acne. So that's acne almost due to like friction and occlusion. So commonly you'll see this in sports players. So if we think back to our patient here, she said that she um, like just started getting this acne and she's a field hockey player. And the distribution of her acne is like, along her jawline and her cheek, probably where she has her helmet, probably where a chin strap might also be. Um, so she probably has acne mechanica. And this has been coming up a lot actually because of COVID, everyone's wearing more masks. So everyone's suddenly getting acne that's all around the chin area. And a lot of that is due to acne mechanica specifically. And then there are also medications. So you should always look at their medication list, seeing if medications might be contributing to acne. Um, so for example, if someone's taking steroids, steroids can cause acne. Okay, so that was case one, pretty easy. Case two is also a classic. So a six-year-old boy is brought in by his mom for an itchy rash that's in his inner elbows and behind his knees. 
So if I were to describe this, the location, it's in his inner elbows and posterior knees. Um, it's pretty pink in color. And the morphology, it's this like ill-defined, scaly, excoriated patch. Excoriated meaning that it looks like it's scratched at. Um, the distribution, it's symmetric, so you can't see in the photo, but it's in both el inner elbows, both posterior knees. And again, the location is similar to description of the distribution. So it's in the flexor surfaces. So in the inner elbows when we're flexing, in the back of the knees when we flex your knees. So this is atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema. Um, eczema is like a chronic, very itchy, inflammatory disease. It's very common in kids. Um, you can't go a single peds derm clinic without seeing at least one eczema patient. Um, for most kids, about uh, two thirds of them will grow out of their kid eczema, but a third of adults will uh, per, uh, will continue to have eczema. And there are also adults who don't get eczema until they're older. They never had it as kids. Um, in older children, like I showed in the photo, the most common areas for eczema are going to be in your flexural surfaces. So that's your anterior fossa, your inner elbows, your wrists, the back of your knees, your neck. Um, and commonly these patients will have the um, atopy triad, which means that they have eczema as well as asthma, as well as allergies. So that's pretty common. Okay, next case. So this is a rash that maybe sort of looks like the one that we just saw. We'll describe it in a second, but this 28 year old guy, he arrives to our clinic. He's complaining of an itchy abdomen. So another itchy rash. He says he's tried aloe vera, um, but wasn't helpful. So the location of this rash is on the lower abdomen. Um, it's kind of pink, kind of dark brown, um, and it's scaly like our last rash was. But this rash, in comparison to the last rash we saw, I would describe as localized, like it's only in this one area, and it's almost geometric, like it's almost forming like a rectangle kind of shape. So when we ask him some more questions, he does tell us that he just bought a new pair of boxer briefs. So this is most likely allergic contact dermatitis. This is another thing we see all the time. So allergic contact dermatitis, almost like eczema, is very itchy. The most common causes uh, are nickel. Uh, so you can see that in your belt buckles. Um, you can see that with watches, sometimes with earrings. Fragrances are another big one. So anyone that comes in with like rash on their neck might could be perfume, um, even fabric softeners in your laundry, nail polish. Actually, the most common place to get a rash if you have a nail polish or nail adhesive allergy is actually your eyelids because your hands touch your eyes so often, your eyes have very, very thin skin. Um, rubber adhesive, so like in the last patient we saw, um, rubber adhesives on your clothing waistband line, that's another classic one, and then latex gloves if you're allergic to that. Um, so when you get a history and somebody comes in with an itchy rash, it's very important to get a good history of their exposures to new products, what they do for a hobby, what they do for work. Um, I have, I've had a patient who was a florist and had uh, a hand dermatitis and it was because she had an allergy to one of the flower compounds that she was using. Um, and then here, like I said, when I was describing almost like a geometric shape, very localized, the shape and the location can be very helpful uh, when you're trying to figure out if something is eczema versus an allergic reaction to something. And then in order to diagnose this, like uh, you can use patch testing. So that's when we uh, take chemicals and we like put them on somebody's back. Um, and if they have a reaction to the chemical, then we consider them allergic to that chemical. Okay, another scaly rash. So this is a 51 year old male. Uh, he comes to your office for a persistent rash. Uh, looks like this, it's on his elbows um, and the outside of his elbows as also on the front of his knees. Occasionally it's itchy, but that's not his primary complaint. So location, knees and elbows, 
color, pink, uh, morphology, we would describe this as a very well demarcated, so you can tell exactly where it starts and stops, uh, a thick plaque with thick, thick white scale. Um, the distribution, it's symmetric, and instead of like the eczema that was in flexural surfaces, these are on extensor surfaces, so the outside of the elbows, the outside of your knees. So this is classic psoriasis. Again, one of those things that I probably see at least once a day, if not more. Um, so this is a chronic inflammatory disease, can affect both your skin and your joints. Actually, you can have uh, psoriatic arthritis. Um, unlike an eczema that uh, commonly starts in kids, um, the peak age of onset for psoriasis is either in your 20s and 30s or your 50s and 60s. Uh, like I said, it tends to be on extensor surfaces, knees, elbows, butt, lower back. Other places that it really likes is actually the ears, your belly button, the scalp it loves, and it can also affect your nails. You can get nail pitting from psoriasis. Um, treatment for psoriasis. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is because if you listen to, if you listen for the commercials now on TV, you will hear all almost every commercial that's about a biologic is a biologic that you can use for psoriasis. So if you listen now to the TV, listen for things like Stalt, for Cosentix, Stellara, Humira. Those are all medications that we can use for psoriasis. All right. So now another kid patient, a uh, five-year-old girl, she's brought into clinic by her dad for these bumps that are on her chest and also on her arm. And dad is worried that they're spreading. This is like another classic case. Um, so the location, dad said chest and arms. Again, these papules, very pink. Uh, morphology, I describe them as these dome-shaped uh, papules that are very smooth. And then each of them seem to have almost like this buttonhole, this central umbilication. And then the distribution of them scattered, they're just like kind of randomly scattered about. So this is molluscum contagiosa. Uh, kids get this all the time, all the, all the, all the time. And parents are always worried because they see all these spots that are um, just appearing on their kids. And some kids, can start kids, they get itchy. For some kids, they can be painful. Um, actually, a lot of kids with eczema can uh, have a higher risk of getting these molluscum. But it's caused by a virus called a pox virus. Um, they are contagious to yourself and other kids, um, but eventually they resolve on their own. So eventually, uh, if you're just a healthy person, your immune system will recognize them, fight them off, and then you'll have the antibodies for them. So that's why we actually don't see them in adults unless uh, if I see them in an adult and it's like all over the place, I actually get worried that they might have an immune uh, deficiency, but usually don't see them in adults because you've probably already been exposed to this virus somehow as a kid and already have the antibodies for it. So another pediatric patient, uh, this is a six week old, uh, is brought in for a growing lesion that's right near the eye. Mom says when he was born, it started off as this small little dot and then it quickly increased in size. So to describe this spot, I'd say it's above the right upper eyelid or on the right eyebrow. It's a bright red color. Uh, it's essentially a papule. You could even call it a plaque. It might be over a centimeter. And there's just one so this is an infantile hemangioma. Another thing that a lot of parents will call us about because um, they're kind of alarming. It's this big red juicy papule on a baby. Um, but actually, uh, although they can grow rapidly, 90% uh, of them will resolve by age 10 and they can resolve on their own. So technically you don't have to treat them. Although we do have treatments that kind of help the process along. The only time you really do need to treat them is if it's on a spot that's going to interfere with function. So in this patient, it is already almost impeding on his eye. So it might affect his ability to see. Um, if it's on the nose, mouth, mouth affects the ability for the baby to eat or on your hands. So in those cases, we kind of don't, not necessarily, we don't give the parent an option. To, we always give the parent an option, but we really, really encourage that they need treatment and we tell them why. Uh, okay, so this is a 23 year old male. Uh, he's concerned about these itchy white spots on the chest and the back. He says they appear every summer and then sometimes just go away on their own and then appear next summer again. 
to describe these, I'd say that they're on the chest and back. Uh, it's these hypopigmented, almost like white or tan uh, macules. If I ran my finger on them, it's probably flat, but they do have a little bit of thin scale. You can see it's a little scaly and the distribution is truncal, uh, meaning chest and back. Um, so I perform a skin scraping with uh, potassium. Uh, okay. So when I see this, this is, we describe it as spaghetti and meatballs. So the spaghetti is these kind of stringy looking things and the meatballs are these ball looking things. So these are, this is fungus, um, specifically uh, malesthesia and and uh, the fungus are these kind of hyphae and the spores are these balls, spaghetti and eat balls. Um, and this is called pityriasis versicolor. The versicolor part of it comes from that it can actually present as different colors in different patients. And even on the same patient, I've seen it be different colors. So in some patients, it might be white patches and macules, and some might be red, and some might be like hyperpigmented or brown. Um, so these fungus, the malesthesia, they love warm, hot, humid conditions. So the classic um, story is usually a guy, and like you said, he, he gets it in summertime all the time and then it kind of goes away and then it pops up again in summer. And the treatment for this, because it's a fungus, treat it with an antifungal, pretty easy. So still in Peds clinic, we see a 15 year old girl. She comes in with a bald patch. She denies that the area is itchy. Uh, you scrape the area, you do a KOH scraping like I did on the last patient, but this time the scraping is negative. So to describe this spot, I'd say it's on the scalp. It's you know flesh colored to brown. It's this very well demarcated. Again, I can see exactly where it starts and stops. This circular, very smooth patch of hair loss, um, and the distribution is localized. She just has this one spot. So this is alopecia areata. Um, alopecia areata is an autoimmune disease that attacks the hair follicles. Um, in some patients, it can resolve on its own. So this spot might just get better on its own, um, but it can commonly uh, reoccur in the same spot or different spots. There's also a couple of variations of alopecia areata. So alopecia totalis is when the whole scalp loses hair. Um, and alopecia universalis is when the whole scalp, as well as your eyebrows, basically any part of your body that bears hair, all the hair is lost. Um, these patients are usually harder to treat. Um, and then it's also important to know that because this is an autoimmune disease, uh, usually uh, uh, alopecia areata can be associated with other autoimmune diseases so like thyroid disorders. So we try to ask patients about their history or um, watch out for any of those signs or symptoms as well. Ah, classic thing that comes into my office all the time. So 67 year old guy comes to my clinic with his wife. They're both worried about this lesion on the back that's growing. So when you hear lesion that's dark and that's growing, most patients as well as other providers um, think, oh God, is this a skin cancer? So let's describe it. It's on the back, it's brown. Um, we describe this in dermatology as having a stuck on look. Like it looks like you might be able to get a fingernail underneath it and just like pick it off. Um, it's verrucous, which means wart-like. So it kind of also looks like a wart. Um, and like I said, it's raised. Um, so we would call it a papule. Um, and distribution, you can't really see it in this photo. You just see one, but he has multiple of these scattered kind of all on his chest and back. So this is something we call a seborrheic keratosis. The kind dermatologists will call it a wisdom spot. Not so nice dermatologists will call it um, birthday barnacles because you get them with age and they kind of look like barnacles, um, but they're super, super common. Uh, they're benign, even though they can look really scary and you just get them with age. Uh, you can get them on your chest, on your back. Uh, patients might tell you the story that they like, they grow, they can grow. That's normal. Um, they might partially fall off and then they come back. And sometimes they can become irritated and itchy when they do become symptomatic like that. They can become itchy. Sometimes we do try to freeze them and that kind of helps them fall off and that can help with the symptoms of that, but you don't have to treat them because they're not dangerous at all. 
This, on the other hand, so 68-year-old woman, she's here for her, her skin check. She reports she has this pimple, what she thinks is a pimple, that's above her right lip. She's had it for five months, and sometimes it just bleeds on its own. So that when you hear that, like, pimple, it's been there for five months, bleeds on its own, that's when you're, you're hearing red flags. You got to worry. So did a little bit closer up uh, so we can see because it has some features here that I'm gonna describe in a second. So location, it's on her face. Uh, it's at, right at the nasolabial fold. So that's the fold from your nose to your cheek uh, for your lip there. Um, it's pink in color. And when I describe it, I'd say this is shiny. It's a papule because it's raised. It has this central ulcer, like a little crust, like it, that's probably where it was bleeding from. And it has these really prominent vessels that you can see up close. And she just has one of them. So that whole description, if I described that to any other person in Durham, they would know for sure I was getting at, I think this is a basal. This is a basal cell carcinoma. This is the way they classically look. Um, it's the most tom common type of skin cancer we see in dermatology. Risk factors include being lighter in skin and having a lot of sun exposure. Um, we tell patients that of all the skin cancers to have, this is probably the best because it's almost never fatal, really rarely metastasizes. But the reason that we need to treat them is because if we continue to let them grow, they can become symptomatic and become a problem. They can ulcerate, they can bleed, they can cause tissue disruption, and they can even become really disfiguring. Um, so this is a seven-year-old guy. He's referred by his primary care physician for a growing lesion on the upper back. Uh, he reports that occasionally it does bother him because it's painful. So this is location upper back, it's pink. And to describe this one, which is different than the last one we saw, this is also a papule, but this one, instead of being shiny, is very hyperkeratotic. And when I say that, I mean, it's very crusty, very scaly. Um, and again, just one. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma. So it's the second most common type of skin cancer. Um, risk factors are similar to a basal, lighter skin, uh, sun exposure, but also a couple other things. So transplant patients, other sorts of immunosuppression, um, as well as chronic wounds. So anytime I get a burn patient um, or a patient that has a chronic wound and I start seeing some weird stuff going on, I, my red flag goes up and I'm like, this might need a biopsy. It could be a squamous cell carcinoma growing within this chronic burn. Um, similar to uh, basal metastasis is not common, but it is more common than a basal. So we do need to worry about it. Uh, it most commonly will go to like your lymph nodes and then uh, pain. It can invade the nerves, which is why these can often be painful. So here we have a 55 year old female. She comes to the clinic for a changing lesion on her right leg. So this is, instead of describing this lesion, I'm going to go through what are the red flag features that are like dinging my bells here, dinging my alarms. So anytime I'm doing a skin check, the skin cancer that we're really worried about is a melanoma because a melanoma can metastasize. It can be fatal. It's bad news. And when we think of melanoma, we think of, we have a mnemonic called A, B, C, D, E. So things that make me worried that the lesion could be a melanoma. Is it asymmetric? So if I were to cut this lesion in half, this side definitely looks different than this side. I look at the border. Is the border kind of like jagged? It's not this like perfect smooth oval or circle. Yeah, I don't like this border. Colors, does it have a lot of different colors? Because that also makes me worry. This one definitely does. It has pink, it has brown, it has dark brown. It has even a little white bluish gray here. Um, the diameter of it, if it's growing, that's worrisome, but also any spot that's over six millimeters, we get extra worried. And then evolving. The patient already told me that she thinks that it's changing. Any change in any of these gets me, gets me nervous. So this is melanoma. Um, a melanoma is basically a type of skin cancer that arise from melanocytes. So those are the uh, cells that produce pigment in our skin. Um, and the way that we, uh, the, a, a patient's like prognosis is based on a couple things. So one, how deep the melanoma invades. So when we do a biopsy, we want to know how deep the melanoma goes. 
Two, if it does already involve the lymph nodes, so if it's spread to your lymph nodes. And then three, if it's spread even farther past your lymph nodes. This picture here on the top right is a picture of um, a, a melanoma uh, with a dermatoscope. So I just wanted to show a picture of that because this is like, I, I, if I forget my dermatoscope at home or my dermatoscope runs a battery, I am like, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to tell what anything is because this tool helps us see so many features that you can't just see with the naked eye. Um, and so here, things that again are making me worried for a melanoma, lots of different colors, asymmetric. It has these atypical globules, this blue white veil, we call this is also worrisome. Um, so it has a lot of features that um, are making me worried when I look at it with my dermatoscope. Other things important to know about melanoma, it can affect your nails. Um, so anywhere you have skin or types of skin like your nails, melanoma can affect. And then it can also affect acral sites, so your palms and your soles, as well as your mucosal sites, like in your lip and your tongue. Um, these sites actually, uh, your hands and your feet and the mucosal sites are more common in skin of color. So let's see where we are on timing. Okay, good, we still have time. Um, so this is a 45 year old guy. Uh, he comes in with a new rash on his chest, um, as well as his upper back and his upper arms a little bit too. Um, he states that he was recently prescribed a medication called Derbinifin, which is an antifungal medication. So uh, location, chest, upper back, upper arms, very pink. And this, it, I would describe this, this has a very specific description. So I call this annular because it kind of looks like it's lighter in the center but darker pink on the edges and like it's forming a ring shape and then hard to see in this photo but there's a little bit of scale kind of where that pink is on the edge of each of these annular lesions and then distribution is truncal so again meaning kind of chest back so this is subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus or SCLE. We don't see this that commonly in dermatology, but it's definitely one of those things that when we see it, we sh as first, uh, even as first uh, year of residence, we should be able to recognize what this is or have it on our differential. So this is a type of cutaneous lupus uh, that forms these like classic annular rings. Um, it's an autoimmune disease lupus is, uh, but it can also be drug induced. So in this case, the patient that we just saw, he had started a medication called terbinafine. Um, and that is one of like a very commonly associated medication to cause drug induced SCLE. Um, SCLE also just like lupus likes uh, areas that are exposed to the sun. So upper chest, neck, upper back, arms. Um, and the treatment for this, the reason I mention it is because you can treat this just like lupus with hydroxychloroquine, uh, which I'm sure is a medication that we had been hearing about at the beginning of the pandemic uh, because some people thought that you could use this for COVID. Um, but it was important to be cautious to not prescribe this medication unless you really needed it because there are real patients out there who need this medication for real skin conditions and real like autoimmune conditions. So we're getting into some like crazier stuff now, uh, things that are not truly bread and butter derm, but um, some like really interesting stuff, stuff that we should recognize again as first year derm residents. Um, and like the reason why derm is uh, more like diverse, I think, than some people think. Uh, so this is a 65 year old patient. You're asked to see him urgently. He developed acutely all these very tense blisters on his whole body. He's extremely itchy. So location, he says it's on his trunk, so his chest, his back, and his arms, so basically all over the place. Um, you can kind of describe it as pink, but the morphology is the most important part here. So you have all these bulla, um, and they're tense. So if I were to press my finger on one of these, it would stay like filled with fluid. It wouldn't just like burst open easily. And then the distribution is just all over. 
So this is bolus impetigo. Bolus impetigo, uh, so not bolus impetigo, bolus pemphigoid, sorry. Bolus pemphigoid is a autoimmune blistering disorder. Um, it's caused by this antibody against uh, the hemidesmosome. So the hemidesmosome is uh, basically helping connect the epidermis and the dermis. So if you think about it, if there's an antibody destroying the like structure that keeps the epidermis and the dermis together, that means the epidermis is gonna lift from the underlying dermis and form these blisters. It uh, co most commonly occurs in elderly people. So almost all my patients who have bolus and metiger are like 65 and older. Um, it is super itchy. Um, initially, it can be hard to treat, but we've actually have um, some pretty good treatments for it now. Okay, so getting in some, some more widespread rashes. So this time, uh, when you're in dermatology and you're a derm resident, not only do you see patients in clinic, uh, but you are also uh, on call or on consult sometimes. So you might get a call to go see a patient in the hospital. So this is what this was. Uh, patient, you're asked, you're called about a patient to see them in the hospital for erythroderma. So erythroderma is a term that we use in dermatology that means that they're just red all over. Um, and so this patient, they tell you, was started on a medication for um, epilepsy that had, he had been diagnosed with just a couple weeks ago, four weeks ago. So this rash, uh, basically all over, but trunk and extremities, um, very, very pink. I bet you if I pressed on it, it would do something called blanching, which means that I press and right underneath my finger, it would turn white and then turn pink again. Um, the way that I would describe this is morbilliform is the buzzword. So morbilliform essentially means it's almost like this mixture of macules. Um, so that's that flat pink, as well as small, small papules. So those are those like raised um, bumps. It'll almost kind of feel like sandpaper if you ran your hand along it. And it's coalescing. So coalescing means they're joining all together into bigger patches and plaques. So in some areas, you can see almost individual little papules. And in some areas, you can't even tell that they're separate because it's all just combining into one big plaque patch um, and distribution as described is just generalized all over, very diffuse. So this patient, it's very suspicious for uh, DRESS, uh, which is stands for um, drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Um, some books have renamed it drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. Uh, so patients will present pretty sick. Uh, they'll have fever. They'll have this widespread rash. They'll have eosinophilia, which means uh, it's this one of our immune cells um, that'll be like in high numbers. And potentially, which is why you worry about dress and you want to recognize it when you see it, is that it can involve and affect internal organs, most common liver and the kidneys. Um, common medications that can cause this. So our patient here uh, was started on a medication for seizures, so anticonvulsant medications like uh, phenytoin um, and uh, <coughs> carbamazepine, uh, NSAID, so like um, ibuprofen. Uh, so phonamides, usually like some uh, anti antibiotics, um, allopurinol, which is used for gout, and minocycline, uh, which is a type of uh, antibiotic. Okay, so this one I didn't give a case, but I just wanted to give a plug. So sometimes dermatologists, they get made fun of because we have, you know, a nice flexible lifestyle, uh, but there are derm emergencies, I promise you. So one of the derm emergencies that we see is something called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, so this will be something, again, that I would get a consult about and uh, you would want to evaluate for and make sure that it is or is not. Uh, so you, when you describe it, you get these targetoids. So it almost looks like it has a almost like a dot in the center and then a kind of ring around it. it almost looks like a little target target um, lesions. And these lesions can progress to uh, flaccid blisters.
blisters. So again, remember how I said some blisters can be tense, you press on it, stays a blister, and some blisters can be flaccid. So if you press on it, it shears and sloughs really easily, which is what you're seeing here. Um, the reason that we worry about Stevens-Johnson is because it can also affect muscous membranes. So it can affect your eyes, it can affect your genitals, it can affect your mouth, um, and that's really worrisome. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's also life-threatening, so it can lead to infections that can lead to electrolyte abnormalities um, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, most commonly, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is caused by drugs, uh, similar drugs actually to dress syndrome that we just saw. Uh, in rare cases, it can also be caused by infection. Okay, so those are all the cases that I had. Um, I thought I'd leave uh, some time for us to like go over questions if we had any questions. Um, can talk to you guys if you have questions just about like dermatology in general. Um, I'm here to answer whatever you guys are interested in. Um, you can unmute yourself and you can put it in the chat, whatever you guys prefer. I have a question. Yeah, of course. So Oh, the last case you said it was kind of like a derm emergency mm -hmm. are those like are those seen in like hospitals like how does that like what's the plan of action for that type of thing yeah so in most cases most commonly uh it'll be a patient that's in the hospital and i'll get consulted to go see them for if i actually get a patient that comes into my clinic and i'm worried that it's sjs i will 100 percent send that patient to the hospital because it will pretty much if it's true SJS, um, it's gonna progress and they need to be in the hospital because they need to have um, IV fluids because they lose fluids really quickly. They need to be monitored for fever, um, for like infection. Um, we need to stop any drugs that we think are a cause. There are a couple different treatments that we can try to give the patient um, to like maybe help the SJS uh, improve. We really don't have that great treatment. So a lot of it is like the most important thing is like supportive, supportive care. Getting okay, them off. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, other things that you do, you always make sure if ophthalmology, the eye docs haven't been consulted, they need to be consulted because like I said, SJS can affect the eyes. Um, and it can result in like scarring and result in vision loss. Um, you also need to consult um, if it's a female OBGYN or urology uh, because it can affect um, the genitals and it can again result in scarring there as well. Um, and then <clears throat> sometimes even ENT needs to get involved. Thank you. Yeah. So I had a question in the chat that says, what do you do when patients are hesitant to get full body checkups and or take certain medications because of beliefs rather than allergies? Um, so yeah, great question. Um, so in terms of full body skin checks, uh, there are there's some debate about whether or not full body skin check like screenings are required. Um, so as dermatologists, the American Board of Dermatology, the AAD, uh, will, they, we feel that there should be, uh, annual screenings for patients, or at least that they're annually checking themselves. Um, and then if they see a lesion that they think is worrisome, then they can come to the dermatologist. And if we do find a skin cancer, once we find a skin cancer on somebody, they're bound to have another skin cancer. It's just statistics. Um, and so we see those patients annually. Once you've had one skin cancer, we're gonna see you every year to make sure. Um, so for patients who are hesitant about full body skin check, I'd say, you know, if you don't have any history of a skin cancer prior, you don't have any family history, you're still young. So you're like, you know, under the age of 45, let's say, um, you might not necessarily need a screening, but you should be like checking yourself, just, you know, have a general sense of your own moles, because I tell patients all the time that they're going to find a mole that's changing before I am, because you live in this body every day, you're gonna notice if something is different before I do. Um, so that's what I tell pa patients first and foremost, if you don't wanna come into the office yet, maybe you don't have to yet, you don't have a high, lot of risk factors, at least be doing your own self checks. Um, and then once, if you have a strong family history, 
Um, I think that in and of itself um, is how I convince people to get uh, full body skin checks, because if they do have a strong family history, they've probably already seen what their family members have gone through. Because if you leave a melanoma is what we really worry about. And that is can be a big surgery. But even if you leave basal cells or squamous cells, if you leave them to grow, that can be a big surgery. Even a really, really small basal cell in the wrong area or a cosmetically sensitive area can also be like a pretty um, significant surgery. So if it's like just on the nose or right near the eye or right near the lip, um, a small spot can be a a meaningful surgery in that area. So that's another reason uh, that I can give to patients that you want to catch these things as early as you can, because the smaller it is, the smaller the surgery, the easier the treatment, even early basils. If you catch them early enough, same thing with squamous cells. If you catch them when they're in, in situ, we call it, are very superficial. You can even treat them without surgery. We have uh, chemotherapy creams that you can use. You could do something called uh, electrodissection and a curatage where you kind of scrape and burn it. You can um, even freeze them sometimes with liquid nitrogen. So when you catch them early enough, there's a lot easier treatments that we can use. Um, so I would say those are the, how I kind of get people to do uh, full body skin checks if they're hesitant about it. Um, and in terms of like taking certain medications, so it's funny because <laughs> one of the reasons I probably got into dermatology and uh, uh, the reason that I can answer this question is because my own mom uh, was somebody who was very hesitant about taking medications. Uh, so she has eczema and pretty, pretty bad eczema to the point that um, it was like all over her body. And she was so hesitant about steroids. She just like heard steroids have terrible side effects. And she like, didn't want to be addicted to steroids. Um, and then finally, when she went uh, to a provider who actually sat down and like listened to what she was you know, fearful about, um, and then, you know, went you know, describe that taking a to steroid by mouth, the side effects are totally different than, you know, putting steroid just topically on your skin that made her feel better about that. Um, so I think to answer that question, it's when you have a patient who's really hesitant or anxious, um, sitting down and trying to figure out, okay, what exactly, where is the anxiety coming from? What are you afraid of? And trying to work through that. And sometimes you can't work through that. And the like beauty of dermatology and the art of medicine in general is that we have so many options to treat things now. Um, it makes it a lot harder for me as a resident to study because I have to, so many more things to learn. Um, but for instance, I just had a patient who had psoriasis and she um, was really afraid of needles and, but just putting topical steroids on her psoriasis wasn't enough. So we kind of talked through like, okay, what if we did a, a needle, but you only had to get that injection every three months? Like, how do you feel about that? And she's like, honestly, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. So then instead there's like a pill that um, you can take that maybe doesn't work as well. Um, but you know, she was like, okay, I'd rather try that first. And then if that doesn't work, then I'll be more open to trying, uh, doing a shot. So she tried the pill didn't work as well. And she was like, okay, I'm okay with doing the shot, but I just don't think I can give it to myself. So then we said, okay, well, how can we figure out how we can get her this injected medication, but that she doesn't have to do it to herself. And then we got insurance to cover for getting in office injections. So she comes like once every three months and she has a nurse inject it and goes home. Um, so you, you really got to talk to the patients, figure out, uh, you know, what they're afraid of, how we can work around it. And like I said, it's, it's the beauty of dermatology and the art of medicine that we have so many options now that you can usually find some way around it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> So another question was, what is your typical schedule like? What are your hours in a typical week? So derm, <laughs> that's very nice hours. Uh, so my typical week, if I'm not on like a rotation where uh, either I'm on call or on consults or sometimes even on surgery, will probably be like an eight to five. Like you have kind of normal work hours, which is nice. Um, 
And my week is might be a little bit different than at other residencies, but the way my week works is so Monday in the morning, I have clinic. It could be a regular derm clinic in like another attendings clinic. It could be peds clinic. It could be um, melanoma clinic, could be room derm clinic, but it's a, a regular, cl it's a clinic. And then Monday afternoon, uh, we have lectures. So at my program, uh, the residents give the lectures, which is kind of fun. And then uh, Tuesday morning, I have clinic again. And then Tuesday afternoon, I have derm path lectures. So it's lectures specifically in uh, dermatopathology. And the attendings here actually give those lectures, which is great because derm path is really hard. I don't even know how I'd be able to teach it to myself. Um, if my cat pops in, this is my cat. He's sitting on the side here. <laughs> um, and then Wednesday, Wednesday morning, you'll have, uh, usually you're in a clinic uh, with an attending. And then here at UConn, Wednesday afternoon, which was this afternoon, actually, uh, all the residents have resident clinics. So that's our continuity clinic. And what I mean by that is that these clinics are, these patients are hours. So I will hold this patient for the rest of the time that I'm here at UConn, which is really nice because then I can see, you know, when I try a treatment for a patient, did that work? Did it not work? Um, and kind of get satisfied if something works or, you know, figure out, you know, what needs to change. And it's nice to uh, kind of see your patients over and over again, and you get to know them really well. Thursdays, um, you just kind of have clinic all day. It'll be one clinic in the morning, one clinic in the evening. Friday, same thing, one clinic in the morning, one clinic in the evening. Um, and then there are certain things that are uh, dispersed uh, throughout your year and kind of depends on what rotation you're on. So which clinic you're in, let's say on Thursday or Friday might depend on if I'm on my Mohs rotation, which I'm on this month. Um, most of my clinics are all doing Mohs surgery, which is the surgery you do to remove skin cancers. Um, if you're on your derm path rotation, you might be more in like derm path. If I'm on my inpatient rotation, I'm more doing inpatient stuff instead of in clinic. Um, so it also kind of varies based on what uh, rotation that you're on. Uh, we also uh, here at UConn, we go to the uh, VA, uh, which is a great rotation because you get a nice mixture of both general dermatology and you get to do surgery there as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my typical, typical day, typical week. Uh, so another question is, how often do you prescribe isotretinoin for acne? Is there a certain reason why dermatologists will prescribe doxycycline versus minocycline versus isotretinoin? So that's a great question. Um, so isotretinoin, we consider it one of our like big guns in acne. So if somebody comes in already to me and they have like severe acne, like that nodule cystic acne that's already scarring, I worry the most about scarring because scarring is essentially permanent. We do have stuff that we can do for it, but um, it can be permanent. So that's what I want to stop. So if somebody comes into me and they're already like really severe, already have scarring, isotretinoin is probably already on my mind, might already be on the table. So isotretinoin, um, <clears throat> the brand name of it is Accutane, although uh, Accutane doesn't exactly exist anymore. Um, and so the reason that we hesitate about using isotretinoin, even though we know it works so well for acne, and let's say somebody who just has mild or even moderate acne, is because it does have side effects. Uh, so the most common side effects are going to be um, dry lips, dry skin, dry eyes, and those are pretty easily handled. Um, but then there are some other side effects. So we need to check labs like um, lipid panels, because in some patients that can make their um, lipid levels go up. So like cholesterol, triglycerides, and triglycerides really. Um, we also have to check the liver labs. Sometimes it can mess with your liver labs. Um, in females, so when you go on isotretinoin, you sign up for what's called an eye pledge program. And the eye pledge program is essentially promise you're like making a contract to promise that uh, if you're a female, um, that you're going to be like on some form of birth control. And the reason is, is because isotretinoin, if you were to become pregnant when you're on isotretinoin, um, it can affect the fetus. And that's like really um, important. And then uh, the other reason why you usually sign a contract is to say that we're going to have monthly checks with you. So when you're on isotretinoin, that's another reason why uh, we, we sometimes hesitate to use it because it requires that uh, the patient is coming to see us every month, um, which can be a lot for a patient. 
Um, so then doxycycline and minocycline, they're uh, antibiotics. So if somebody comes to me with like moderate acne, let's say, and not a lot of scarring yet, that's when I might consider using an antibiotic. Uh, for females, sometimes you can also use like birth control. It can help treat acne. Oh, certain birth controls can. Um, spironolactone is another uh, medication that I'll use in females probably actually more commonly than uh, antibiotics, but like for a male who can't be on birth control pill, can't be on um, spironolactone, um, you can use doxycycline or minocycline. So they're both tetracyclines. That's the class of antibiotics that they are. Um, I find that I use doxycycline more often than minocycline. Um, I just find that minocycline for me has had more uh, reported side effects that are like kind of unusual. Um, uh, so one of them being, uh, you can get hyperpigmentation from uh, being on minocycline. Doesn't happen to everybody, but it can happen. In some people it'll happen and be temporary, but in some people it can actually be permanent. Um, actually my sister uh, was on minocycline and she got some like dark spots on her lips. They went away when she stopped taking it, but it can happen. Um, doxycycline, the most common side effects, sometimes people have GI upset. Um, so that would be the most common reason why somebody tells me that they can't take it because they just can't tolerate um, like the non nausea or like stomach upset. Um, it can also make you a little bit more sensitive to the sun. Um, so those are all kind of the things that I think about when I'm thinking about antibiotic versus isotretinoin versus just topical things for acne. So my tree for going up in acne treatments is probably if it's mild, we'll try some topical things first. If it's moderate, if you're a female, I'll do birth control or spironolactone, maybe an antibiotic. If you're a male, then an antibiotic. And if it's at the point of severe um, or with scarring, then I'm probably at doing an isotretinoin. Uh, okay. Next question was, <laughs> what is your skincare routine? Your skin looks great. Thank you for the compliment. Um, so I would say that if I could tell anybody to do like one thing, uh, it would be sunscreen, which probably sounds like a very, uh, <laughs> cop out answer, but it's very true. Uh, you won't maybe appreciate it now, but you'll appreciate where you're a lot older. I've just seen so many older people with who are coming in and they want us to fix the wrinkles and the photo aging and then the skin cancers, obviously too. Um, so if you start early, it, things are easier to prevent than they are to fix. So definitely sunscreen. Uh, the other thing is that uh, topical retinoids uh, are really good for both acne and one of the only topicals that have literature about uh, also aging. Uh, so wrinkles, like fine wrinkles, more preventative again than a uh, fixer. Um, and so they have retinoids that you can get prescribed. So <clears throat> tretinoin or retin-A are names of ones that you can get prescribed by your dermatologist. Um, and that's um, like topical that you'd put on at night. And then there are ones that you can also get over the counter. Um, so Adapalene, I think is one or different is the brand name that you can get over the counter. And then there are uh, <clears throat> ones that are retinols. Um, and those are in our, like our classic, like um, not even at the pharmacy, but probably in just like any skincare product. So if you look for a skincare product that has retinol in it, um, those are usually in the products that are anti-wrinkle products or um, acne products will have retinol in them. So those are my like very easy, everyone should do skincare routines. Uh, okay, was dermatology hard to match in? Uh, did you have to have high step scores, do research, meaningful letters of recommendation? Uh, so dermatology is definitely considered one of the residencies, uh, that is competitive. Um, I would say you don't have to have a amazing stellar step score, but if your step score is, you know, mediocre, uh, then you definitely need to beef up your uh, resume in other ways, which is totally legitimate. Um, so I think the most 
important thing when it comes to your application for dermatology is that you prove that you're dedicated to dermatology. And you can prove that in lots of different ways. Some people are really into research. That's cool. Um, you can do research. You can do a research year if you really want to. You don't have to do a research year. Um, you could do bench research. You can just do clinical research. Um, if you're not into research, you can do projects. You can volunteer. Um, there's a camp. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. It might be Camp Discovery, or I could have made that up, but there's like a camp um, for, there's a summer camp for kids that have um, <clears throat> chronic skin conditions. You can volunteer for that camp. Um, you can volunteer to do um, skin cancer screenings. Um, you could do like a project with, um, you know, high school or middle school students. Like you can do other stuff that's not just research, um, but you need to show somehow that you're like, dedicated to dermatology and you're dedicated to improving the field um, because that is what's gonna shine on your resume when you go through applications. Uh, and then definitely, definitely, definitely meaningful letters of recommendation. And that can be, you know, you can do a, uh, hit two birds with one stone by doing uh, research with a mentor and getting a letter of recommendation, doing a project with a mentor, getting a letter of recommendation. I would say almost, Every single interview invite I got uh, during the application process, I could link to one of my own mentors, one of my letter writers. Um, so that's definitely important because if you think about it, dermatology is a pretty small field. So you know, like recognize names. And so it's very easy for, um, you know, let's say I'm a program director, I can, and I get a letter from Dr. S Dr. X. It's very easy for me to contact Dr. X through email by calling them up and saying, hey, you know, you wrote this letter for Kim. Um, I was wondering, could you like tell me more about her? And, you know, networking is huge in dermatology and definitely can get your foot in the door. So, meaningful letters and recommendation, definitely important. Um, and then the step sourcing too, um, going back to the step, you know, step one is going to pass fail. So I think the other stuff is definitely going to matter a lot more now. Step two, I guess, is still um, a score. And so right now, I think it's just going to push the pressure on to step two uh, until they make that pass fail whenever they do that. But uh, I think even if you have not the most stellar step score, you can get around that by just beefing up other parts of your application. Okay, uh, another question. You mentioned that sometimes there are conditions that do not look anything like the textbook picture. How would you diagnose these conditions? So we have a kind of joke in dermatology. Uh, Every uh, Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month, our program does grand rounds. So we bring really interesting patients and we talk about them as a group. Sometimes it's patients that we just think are interesting and we want other people to see and learn from. And sometimes it's cases that are really hard and that provider just needs help either diagnosing it or figuring out how to treat it. Uh, and so the way that we run the grand rounds is that the first years, we'll see the photos of the rash or the lesion. Uh, we usually actually have, we used to have the, we used to bring the patients in person, but we haven't been doing that because of COVID. So now we do it by pictures. But anyway, so the first years, we'll describe what it looks like, kind of similar to what I did in the presentation. I showed you a picture and then I described what it looked like. And then the second years uh, are responsible for uh, going through a differential diagnosis. And the joke that we have is that sarcoidosis and syphilis are almost always on our differential because sarcoidosis and syphilis can literally look like anything. So there's the classic uh, sarcoidosis that you'll see in a textbook and then it can, it honestly doesn't matter because that thing can look like anything. Um, so the way to diagnose it is biopsy. So taking a skin sample, um, that's probably the crux of dermatology. If you can't figure out what it is, biopsy it. Sometimes even a biopsy, <laughs> you would think the biopsies are black and white and they would give you an exact answer. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they can only give you a pattern of what they're seeing under the microscope and still give you a differential of what it could possibly be, but it at least helps you put you in the right category of skin diseases, uh, which can be helpful. So biopsy. 
Um, so that was the last question. Uh, we're right a um, few minutes after 7.30, so I don't wanna keep anybody. Um, if anybody has any remaining questions or even just questions that come up you know, a couple months from now, uh, feel free to message me. You can either message me on uh, my Instagram, which is dr.skinshow, um, skin, S-K-I-N, show. Um, and then Shao, my last name is S-H-A-O. You should probably smell that too. I'll write it here actually. Um, or you can email me. Uh, so my email at UConn is that. I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, if you're thinking about dermatology and you want some help or you're actively applying for dermatology and you want some help, um, I'm an open book. Uh, so I'm happy to help anybody. Yeah, again, thank you so much for coming. We learned a lot and I love looking at your cases and your pictures. It was very organized and yeah, no worries. And um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. You too. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for the invite. This is a great idea. I love it. Thank you.